looking to achieve here is tie together a lot of what you've just heard from opportunities, funding, research, but pulling it together into a practical sense. The opportunities that I believe sit in the City of London, but a lot of these opportunities that you're going to see and hear about probably sit elsewhere across Ontario and in Canada. But I'm going to selfishly use this as a bit of a sales pitch for London, covering off these main areas. So in London, we have some very typical programs when it comes to waste diversion, nothing too, too fancy. We do have a number of private and municipal waste diversion facilities. And from, uh, for those that don't know London, we're about a mid-sized community for Canada, about 370,000 people. When you go into the large area, we're starting to approach about half a million. Diversion rate, we always talk about that. It's measured on a ton basis. Wrong, but that's what we've been doing for years. We've got about a 45% diversion rate, 55% to landfill. We have very, very good recording numbers because we control a lot of the systems in London. So we're fortunate that way. Why are we only at 45% diversion? Well, we don't have a green bin program. No surprise there. That's a whole other discussion. We'll touch on probably one or two points associated with that on why not as we go through this. But of course, we know what's in the garbage bag. Many of you do know that. Uh, research has been done over the last heck, 15 years on this uh, Ontario-wide. Our numbers are very, very consistent with communities that don't have green bin programs. That's what you're going to find in the bag in the way of your organic content. That's primarily your food scraps. So you're looking at 45% by waste and if you, or by weight, and if you're over in the multi-residential sector, you're about 35%. So a community with a green bin program, it would probably cut that in half. That's about all, though. There's still a lot of organics being missed, and there always will be. And in fact, in some municipalities that we've studied, it's actually even a lot higher than that, too. So a program collecting not a lot of material. So in London, what you see on the screen there is our Waste Management Resource Recovery Park. It's a thousand acres. In it, to the, this side of the screen, is our landfill site. That is about 350 acres. Has nine years capacity left. So that block we refer to as our Resource Recovery Park. We're building something for the future. What we have on that site right now, taking another little look at it, is we have our large recycling center. It is 75,000 ton per year and can be retrofitted up to 100,000 ton based on the way it was designed. You can probably barely see in the back end, we're about one kilometer off the 401, so we're ideally situated for future growth when it comes to what we can do in this particular area. London has been known for years to be not only an energy from waste community, we've had two incinerators in the past, both energy recovery facilities, but we've also had a very large landfill, and that has been our, 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 our base of business for years. Not our desired future, but I think everyone in the room knows that a landfill site does have an important role in a community. We call it, in our neck of the woods, one of our best assets around. It keeps our costs contained. As we move forward, we're in a vital point in time in London's history right now, we are looking at two major projects. We're doing a resource recovery plan for the future, looking at the next 20 to 30 years on what are we going to be doing with our materials in London and the surrounding area and looking at other feedstock streams. As well, with nine years capacity is the ideal time to look at that future of our landfill site. There's nothing better than building a landfill site and not needing it because you just keep it in agricultural purposes. So for us, whether we're going to go up another lift on our landfill site or go out, we have all the land around us that will be determined through the environmental assessment. The resource recovery plan is a side project that dovetails nicely into an EA for those that have followed EA processes, but it's not a requirement of the Environmental Assessment Act. So those pieces dovetail nicely. So there's your setting. So what we have beside our recycling center on that huge parcel of land is a star. And when we, came, when we went to council a year and a half ago, we said that is where we want to put our bricks and mortar, and build a London Waste Resources Innovation Centre. Then we said, why build something if you can capitalize on what already exists, and we'll come back to that. But our original concept was to take advantage of our large recycling centre, and we've done that. We've done a lot of product testing and MRF testing with businesses who've come in and said, how do our materials move through your recycling centre? And we've helped track that. Then we get into debate on how these things help hinder recycling processes. We then looked at other opportunities, and along the way, Council said, this is a great idea, let's capitalize on this. So they gave us a little bit of funding to explore some opportunities, and we did. So after one year, we were amazed with the interest. 
for an investment of about $6,000 in total in that range. We grabbed 15 research papers, excellent work done, great benefit for us, and the students working on this saw how the information would be practically used at the city, and it has been. We applied and got an FCM grant from the Green Municipal Funds. We're working with the Biogas Association, and we've actually signed one memorandum of understanding with a gas phase reduction company. So in one year, for a minimal investment, things worked out quite well. The renewable gas side of things, part of that project with FCM, we're looking at a little differently. Uh, looking at not only the source-separated organics going off to a biogas plant, but we're also taking that bold new step, if it makes sense, into mixed solid waste. What happens when you have your facility-separated organics going off to a biogas plant? Yes, your digestate quality will diminish and all that, but heck, if your plant's beside your landfill site, really what you've done is created yourself a nice landfill cover. So there's ways to work on a comprehensive system that way. It's been done elsewhere, so there's not a lot of novel stuff here. But when you start looking at return on investment, you have to start looking at how these facilities can work side by side. Just another slide looking at that very notion where, go back five years ago, mixed solid waste was just part of the evil empire. It made no sense. But when you tie it together with other facilities and programs, it just might be a solution for some municipalities in certain areas. Gas phase reduction, fascinating, because 20 years ago, this technology was up and running in Hamilton, Australia, and parts of the US, destroying hazardous waste. Patent issues, all those types of challenges that occur, we're now resurrecting this technology with the developer, with some investors, to determine what would happen if you actually ran household garbage into this. What will, it's part of the family of waste conversion technologies. We keeping it, we're keeping it separate from energy from waste, just to stay away from that, what sometimes becomes that tainted word, but it's a technology that has been proven in the past, we just don't know whether it'll have the same results and at what cost on garbage. ICFAR stands for the Institute of Chemicals and Fuels from Alternative Resources. This is your bricks and mortar in London, just north of London, part of Western University. Uh, and it's been operating for about five to seven years. Their focus has been on biomass, woody wastes, but the professors and scientists there now are turning their minds as part of uh, waste, manager, waste management centers of excellence across Canada to what can we do with solid waste. And a really fascinating piece we're working on when you begin to blend products together. So these slides, uh, some of you may know Dr. Franco Baruti. He's the head of the ICFAR, a very large institute with great equipment, great research capabilities, proven contracts, and are just having challenges sometimes with commercialization. They've moved one or two into the marketplace, but it's a really an existing location that has attracted worldwide attention. So a number of uh, uh, people have worked through that student-wise. We've actually worked with them directly. This is where a number of our student papers came from. The bottom part of this is actually kind of cool too. This is Western University saying, we've got to do more collaboration across the different faculties. And in fact, Dr. Jamie Baxter is here. He's one of those 19 collaborators at the bottom with an idea. It's at the idea stage. But look at those disciplines. Eight different disciplines all being brought together. And the City of London has been part of that development and thinking, saying, we want that expertise. We want that expertise working on projects in London and elsewhere in Ontario and Canada. Uh, the facility, 25,000 square feet, fascinating pieces of technology that exist there right now, doing some really, really cool things. They're beginning now to look at plastics res uh, residues as well, beginning to look at the organic fraction of MSW. So here's a city pushing the researchers saying, you're into something cool, you're into agricultural wastes and biomass and all that wonderful stuff. How do you begin to bring that intel into the, the realm of solid waste management and begin to have those mutual benefits? Their two primary products right now are bio oils and biochars, doing reasonably well. Markets are there, the price points aren't. That's where the big challenge is right now. Feedstock opportunities. We're gonna throw out some ideas that we're playing around with here in London. Of course, 35,000 tons of recyclables all going off to traditional markets. Is that the future? We're not sure. We look at our landfill gas at our landfill site. We look at greenhouses that need a fuel source. We look at those opportunities. Our garbage that we basically put in a landfill site right now, yes, it represents resource recovery opportunities, there's price points, there's environmental considerations, all part of that. We also have IC9 materials that come in to our landfill site. Some go off to landfill sites in Michigan and southwestern Ontario, further west of us, but they all represent different kinds of opportunities. 
We also have uh, wastewater treatment residuals representing opportunities. Most of the scientists and researchers have just not looked at the collaboration between the different products that could be actually be produced from an energy content, potentially from a soil amendment content, uh, from different types of covers. Then kind of one of my new favorites, there's been research done on the agriculture industry looking at it from an energy content, switchgrass at the bottom. Big research that was done in the Elmer area just south of uh, London. Research that just sits on a shelf right now because someone hasn't figured out how do I begin to move this into the larger marketplace. So you look at how you begin to combine these different materials together and there's some tremendous research opportunities. And one of my favorites that's been my favorite for years, it's part of today's agenda, it's been just kicked around in Ontario forever. So what did the Europeans do? They titled it differently. Rather than refuse derived fuel, they now call it solid recovered fuel. They actually have a standard for it. And they've said, hey, the reason we're doing now an engineered fuel is that we will tell you the calorific value, we will tell you about chlorine, we will tell you about mercury. So the Europeans have set the standard and they've created a product. I'm not sure we're at that stage here in Canada or Ontario, but it is something when you start looking at that residual material, if you, too, if you do truly want to move forward to that near zero waste or near zero emissions, there will be no possibility of ever being at zero. Let's face it. Is this a dream? Well, in part it is, except when you look around the world, you see these pieces already in action. One of the oldest ones is the Otter Lake facility down in Halifax. You have a, some very old wonky technology there that's all being looked at again to figure out how to do it, but they were one of the first in Canada that said they wanted uh, limited carbon going into the landfill site, basically. So they process and handle their materials quite extensively, and they've had some very good reasonable success. Mike Kapansky is here from Miller. He knows this system probably as well as anyone. Then you look at uh, Edmonton, and we have a colleague in here from Edmonton today talking about their plant. Plants, plural. Uh, great facility, many cool things happening there. What we don't know a lot about, and it's a real shame, are costs. What are the costs of these facilities? And this is one of the things that we've always said when you come work in London, cost is important as an environmental benefit, as a social benefit. But you really got to appreciate the cost structures for these things to take off. When it comes to Edmonton, maybe we'll hear more today, is we just don't know what these programs are costing out there and how we compare. Hopping over the pond now, big, big integrated waste management, eco-industrial type parks exist right now. What you see here, one is uh, outside of Helsinki. In the background, you see the old landfill site, and that is essentially what it once was, a landfill operation. And in the foreground, what you see is all the recovery facilities that have moved in to take advantage of all that space and then anything that, hey, those mistakes that aren't, that don't commercialize, you put them in the landfill site. Very, very simple relationship like that. And another one, we've met with the, the folks involved with this one. This is in Kallenberg, Germany, about four hours from Munich. Um, same idea, you see where the landfill footprint is? And over the years, they built an entirely brand new resource recovery facility to minimize the use of the landfill site. Okay, research opportunities, and I'll wrap up. And we, we're looking at, the, and you've got the specialists here in the room today on these ideas. But when you look at federal government, what we're saying is this whole notion of integrated feedstocks. We're, we, we work in, in silos far too often when we start looking at those opportunities across all those streams coming together. Technology, when things fail, it gets pushed under the carpet. We don't get a chance to learn on why things are not working. And we, in London, or London, in Ontario, we've had some cool plants that have gone under and it is so difficult to find out why. You just don't learn from that. FCM, always a good body wanting to test new ideas. Provincially, we're not exactly sure what those pots of gold look like right now. But there is talk about these things and there's revenues that are going to be raised, maybe. But as an industry, we have opportunities to capitalize on this with good ideas to look at those next generation of resource recovery plants. So not only did you hear about NSERC and those pieces, there are other opportunities that are coming forward as part of these policy and legislation that is still traveling at a very high level, but there's hints of strong research potential. And then finally, last slide here on just what's going on here in London. It is this opportunity that is rare. We're doing an environmental assessment on a landfill site and resource recovery plan hand in hand. For a municipality like London and many municipalities, these are rare, rare opportunities. So uh, 
We're encouraging students to get very involved in these projects. Uh, we'll be working with Western on a couple ideas. A colleague here is from Fanshawe College. We'll be having further dialogue on this because these are those once in a lifetime opportunities for students to get very involved on things where literally four to six years or maybe eight years later, they will see something built, they will see the test results, or they will see how that research has traveled elsewhere in Ontario, Canada, uh, and local policy. Uh, we, we have a council right now that is very much open to new ideas and partnerships, uh, no different than a lot of other municipal councils out there, but our offering at the City of London is that we have this very large playground, we've got some good partners already, and what do we have that's very important to us? We have a large resource recovery area that's properly zoned to move forward in the future. So there's, uh, I guess, my sales pitch on a variety of things, so thanks. <laughs>